Hello, thank you. Thank you for joining. Uh, our lecture for today is uh, Google Workspace Forensics, Insights from uh, Real World Hunts and Instant Response. My name is Doron Carmi, and uh, on my left is uh, my friend, Ariel Scharf. We are both uh, senior cloud researchers at Mitiga, and also we have some, something in, in common. And today we are going to talk about uh, Google Workspace Forensics. We're going to share a little bit about what is Google Workspace, a little bit about the log structure, and some challenges that we found in, in the logs while performing uh, forensic inv investigations. We are going also to talk about what we did in order to overcome those challenges and share some uh, real cases that we found during uh, incident response and threat hunts. At the end, we are going to show a particular visibility gap that we found in uh, Google Drive. So let's start. So first of all, what is Google Workspace? As uh, you may know, Google Workspace is a cloud-based uh, collection of tools that were designed to make collaboration between individuals and organization much easier. It, included, uh, in, it includes many services, such as Google Drive, Gmail, Google Calendar, Google Keep, and more. What you have to know for this lecture is that this is a very, very popular uh, uh, platform. There are more than six million pay, paying businesses all over the world, which makes it a high target for threat actors to uh, exploit and steal data. A little bit about the logs before we dive into, it, into them. So first of all, they are divided by the service. Once you enable Google uh, Workspace logs, they are divided by the services that you have enabled. They are collected in near real time, and the typical retention period is six months, with some exceptions. Today we are going to be focused specifically on Google Drive, but everything that we are going to say apply to all the logs in Google, Drive, in Google Workspace. But before we start, we would like to share with you a story. Cool. Hi. Before Doron dives into the log structure, I want to share with you a story. One of our customers saw that internal data was published publicly and want us to investigate it. So we got to work. As part of our investigations, investigation, we ran basic anomalies detections and found suspicious activity. We saw an external user from gmail.com that performed approximately 15,000 download events at the same time step. It's a lot, and it was really interesting, and we had a lot, a lot of questions about that. For example, what are the file paths? Who created them? Who shared the files ex externally? In order to answer these questions and more, now we're going to learn about Google Workspace log structure with Doron. So let's talk about the log structure. On your left-hand side, you can, see, you can see a typical log record from Google Drive. We can see many pieces of information that are relevant for forensic investigation. For example, we can see the caller, which is the email, which is the entity that performed the action. We can see the, we can see the IP address, uh, we can see the application name, and more. What we also can see is a list of dictionaries which called events, which we expanded here on the right-hand side. For example, we can see an event of type upload, and its parameters. The parameters is another list of dictionaries that represent the parameters of each call. So what we can see here is actually two lists of dictionaries for each log entry. This is quite, quite challenging, as you may agree. But other than the, other than the log structure, we found other challenges uh, in Google uh, Drive and Google Workspace logs that we are going to show you right now. For example, the first thing, User agent field is missing. There is no user agent across all the logs of Google Workspace. We can see many types of information, again, such as the IP address, the, the event name, and more, but there is no user agent. And it might, might be challenging when you want to perform some anomaly detection without having the user agent. Another, another thing that we found is IP addresses inconsistencies. Here we can see three download events coming from the same user, which is blurred, but this is the same user, from Google Drive, all in the very same second, but from three different IP addresses. This could be misleading the investigator while performing, performing the investigation. Another thing that we found is that there are no path in file-related uh, log entries. For example, in download event, you cannot know from where this uh, file was downloaded. 
you can see some information about the document, such as the document title, the document type, the document name and ID, but you cannot know the path. So we can all agree right now that this is quite challenging, but what you can do in order to make it much easier to read, to investigate, and to be ready for an attack. So let's talk again about the log format and specifically about the events. What we can see here is a list of dictionaries that represent the events of each log entry. And why there is a list of, uh, a list of events? This is because the way uh, Google tied uh, different events is the following. There is one event that will be marked as a pri the primary event, and this is actually the action that was taken by the user. For example, in this case, this is upload. But following this event, this event triggers other actions in the, in, uh, the background that are all, all related. This is uh, quite difficult to understand. So what we do in order to make it easier to investigate, we split each sub-event in the events field into a dedica dedicated row. So here we can see three different events that originally were uh, this, uh, part of the same chain, and we split them uh, into different rows. Try to think about the case that you would like to ser search for all the files that were uh, publicly at some point in your organization. You, do, uh, you don't care if it was created as public or was private and then uh, moved to be, to be public. Uh, you, you just would like to know that it was public at some point. With this technique, you just need to search for the event name that represent public access, and you will know all the files that were public. Another thing that we would like to uh, highlight is the talking about the parameters. The parameters represent the parameters of the call that was taken. For example, here again, we see the upload event, and we can see a list of dictionaries that represent the parameters of the call. For example, we can see that this is, this is a primary event. We can see the document ID, for example, and we can see whether this file is encrypted or not. What else we can see is that each uh, dictionary has two types of keys. First one is the name, the name of the parameter, and four other keys that represent the type of, the, of, of this key, of this, param uh, of this parameter. For example, the first one, primary, primary event, is Boolean. Uh, the second one, document ID, is string because the value is populated. And the third one is also Boolean. In this case, from our, our research, we found out that whenever everything is null, it means Boolean set to false. So again, this is quite challenging. You would like to investigate something. You would, you would like to be fast. You would, you would need to understand the logs uh, right away. So what we do, we restructure the data format. We actually omit all the type-related uh, keys, and we leave only the parameter name and its value. This is much easier to read, much straightforward, and the investigation can be much quicker. The third thing, third thing that we do is we enrich the data. What do, I, what do I mean? Under the parameter, in some, some occasions, you may see the originating app ID. Not sure if you can see it here. Originating app ID, the third parameter. And this ID represents the application that took an action on behalf of the user. So in the log, you will see that the email address or the actor that took the action is someone in the organization. But actually, this action was taken by, by an application. And sometimes this is important to understand during an investigation. For example, in this case, this is the Slack application. Remember earlier that we talked about IP address inconsistencies? This could be one of the reasons why we see those inconsistencies, because Sometimes the IP address would be the IP address of the hosting provider of the application, but the actor will be the user, and this mismatch could be uh, confusing. So understanding this is coming from an application would help the investigation. Now back to Ariel to tell us more about the exfiltration case. Thanks, Doron. Now we are going to talk about data exfiltration from Google Drive. Let's start from the basics. There are six event names that may be related to data exfiltration in Google Drive. The most obvious, of course, is download. Threat actors also can view files. They can send them in email as attachment. They can print them. You'll note that they don't need to physically print them in order to exfiltrate a huge amount of data. They can print, print them to PDF files, of course. They can preview them. And the least intuitive, they can copy them to more convenient location. For example, to a public folder. When you suspect a user, you can search which exfiltration related events the, this user performed. And also in Threat Hunt, when you want to generate leads, you can search for anomalies in these events appearances. For example, this is an anomalies graph based on these events. 
each line is a user, and as you can see, we can see how many exfiltration related events each user performed over time. For example, the green user here performed on February 27th approximately 20K of exfiltration related events, and it might be really interesting to investigate it. Now let's talk about sharing files in Google Drive. We're going to talk just about, about sharing files from shared drive and, and not from the private drive. So when you share a file or folder in Google Drive, this window pops up. In this window, under the general access section, you can choose a group, anyone with a link, your organization, or restricted. Restricted means just user, users that you explicitly mention in the upper section get per permissions to this object. And also you can choose access scope, viewer, commenter, or editor. In our example, we changed the, the group from our organization to anyone with a link. This click actually generated four events, two change document visibility events, and two change document access scope events. In this table also, you can see three parameters we extracted from the parameters column, target domain, old value, and new value. At first look, it may be really confusing, but when you are looking back, you can see here a pattern. In the first couple of events, the start state, people within domain with link and can view access scope, changed to the clean state, private and none. After that, in the next couple of events, the clean state changed to the end state, people with, with link and can view access scope. You'll note that even though we didn't change the access scope, it still goes through the clean state to none. Now let's talk about how share file or folder with a concrete principle looks like in the log. When you share a file with concrete principle, it's straightforward. There is one event that's called change user access, and the actor of this event is the user that actually performed that. Easy. But when you share a folder with concrete principle, something interesting happened. For the main folder, there is one event that's called change user access, and the actor of this event is the user that actually performed that. But after that, for each file and folder recursively under the main folder, there is a special event that's called change user access hierarchy reconciled, and the actor of these events is system. And you'll note that all of these events is pri are primary events and not part of a chain of events, like Dawn described earlier. Now, back to our, our story from the beginning. Just a reminder, we saw an external user from gmail.com that performed approximately 15,000 of download events at the same timestamp, and it's a lot. One of, one of the questions we asked ourselves was, what are the file paths? The straightforward solution, of course, is using API, but there are two pr problems with that. First, using API, uh, to use API, you need proper permissions, and when you are an external investigator, you don't always have them. And always, and uh, I'm sorry, and uh, second, uh, when, you, when you use API calls, you get the, the current state of the organization. And when you investigate, you want the historical state. So we try to think what, what we can do in order to get the paths based on the log records only. In our research, we saw that for each file or folder creation, there is a create event, of course, but also there is a to folder event. In, th in this event parameters, there are the document ID title, and also there are the destination folder ID title. Based on these events, a to folder events, we built this table in this table, you can see the document ID, the destination folder title, and the destination folder ID. Now, if you think about that, if all the destination folders, you have also the add to folder events, you can try to search these IDs, the destination folder IDs, in the left column, the doc ID, and try to build the paths recursively. So that's what we actually did. This table is from our lab, don't worry. Here you can see the event names, the document title, and the calculated document path we build in this cool technique. You'll note that in this technique, the paths might be partial, of course, depending on the log time frame. If you don't have the relevant add to folder events, you can do that. Back to the story, we search, just to, do, to, to, to close the story, we search in the log uh, which user shared, shared externally the files, we saw this user was an admin user. Long story short, this user was compromised by phishing attack. 
And after we understood that, we investigated the logs in the relevant time frame. Finally, I want to share with, with you a visibility gap we found in Google Workspace <coughs> logs uh, two months ago. When we investigate, when we investigate, we assume consistency in the logs. What do I mean? All of us already knew that there is an event about download file. So every time a user download file, there is a log record about that, right? So it's not as simple as that. Let's talk a little bit about licenses. In Google Workspace, each user has the free license, Cloud Identity Free, and this license enables basic features. In addition, an admin can purchase other licenses in order to enable more features. In this example, you can see that in this, in th in this organization, there is a paid license that's called Google Workspace Enterprise Plus, but this license isn't assigned to this user. In our research, we found that if a user doesn't have any paid license, there are no log records on their private drive at all. Not about download files, copy files, create files, and so on. It's crazy to think about. Just with a free license, there are no log records on their private drive in, Google, in organizational Google Workspace. Based on this finding, we try to think how the attacker can exfiltrate not just the private drive, but also the shared drive with minimum log records. Now we want to share with you a use case how the attacker can perform something like that. In this use case, the compromised user is an admin user because an admin user has the permissions to revoke and assign licenses. So in this use case, the threat actor can revoke the paid license to the compromised user, copy all the files from the shared drive to the private drive, download all the files from the private drive, and finally reassign the paid license to the compromised user to be discreet as possible. Now let's talk about the logs. For the revoke and reassign the relevant log records under admin audit log, user license revoke and user license assignment. For the copy files, actually it's interesting. In general, for each copy file in Google Drive, there are two log records, source copy on the original file and copy on the destination file. These events are almost the same, so usually it's not interesting to monitor both. But in our special case, there are no copy events at all because there are no log records on the private drive. So they are just source copy events. And for the download of the files, there are no log records at all. Based on this research, we understood that in our investigation, we should search also for license revoke and assign in short time, and also we should search for source copy events without related copy events. Go on to you. So let's talk about what, what we had today in this talk. So we talk a, a little bit about what is Google Workspace, how the logs structured, and what are, are the challenges in, in those logs. We talked, uh, we talked about the challenges in the structure itself, but also about some pieces of, of information uh, that aren't present in, in the logs. For example, the user agent, the inconsistencies of the IP, uh, the file path, and more. Uh, Ariel shared, shared with you a real cool use case of data, data exfiltration and the visibility gap that we found in Google Drive. But now you might ask yourself, what now? What, what do I need to, know, to do now? So first of all, we think that the first thing that you would, you, would need to know, you would need to do is to know the logs, to understand the limitation of Google Workspace logs, to understand what it gives you, what it doesn't give you, and to be able to, uh, to know it before an attack, before you need to actually perform an investigation. In one week time, we recommend you to start and facilitate the Google Workspace log readability, exactly what, like we showed you, to uh, split uh, the rows, to split the events into different rows, to flatten the parameters, and to make the logs ready for an investi investigation. And once it's ready, in one month's time, we, re we recommend you to start proactively monitoring for data exfiltration cases from your organization to understand if someone somehow uh, was able to exfiltra exfil exfiltrate data out of the organization. This was our talk. On the left QR code, you can see a link to our blog where you can find more, in more information and the right QR code is for our advisory that we shared with Google. Thank you very much.
think the word though. The mic. Check, check. Oh. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you for the presentation. That was great. Uh, I'm curious. So I've done, uh, I've, I've set up uh, event logging where I could have a notification or an alert um, if stuff happens in GCP uh, in like their logging, they have a logging product where they can actually show, you know, kind of more or less the same thing but for, you know, different GCP applications. Do you know if, if uh, Google Workspaces and uh, GCP share the same resources for the back end where I can actually query uh, those logs from the logging platform? Query Google Workspace for on GCP. It, they, it, usually Google shares a lot of resources on the back end. So they share a lot of uh, platforms. I'm not completely sure. I think that you would need to store them in some other solution to be able to query it, cross query those resources. Um, but we need to check that. I'm not completely sure. Thank you.